Well, it's Sunday, the 14th of August, 2022. And before it gets too hot, it's still only about nine o'clock in the morning. Um, I'm gonna do some gardening. Yes, I've got wellies on and one glove. Wellies because they're easy to put on for a start. And secondly, there's some thorns and odds and ends. So it keeps my feet okay and comfortable. It's not because it's wet, it's as dry as a bone. We've had a drought, uh, virtually no rain in July. We had one, we did have one day when it rained, but that was quite ineffective. Um, so for about the seven, six, seven weeks we've had very hot weather, uh, record temperatures uh, in some places in this country up to 40 degrees. Um, it being the 30s again today. And we have a red weather warning that it's hot, so we've got to be careful, hence hat. And you know, keeping out the sun as best we can. But I'm gonna do two things today. One, I'm gonna pick some blackberries and some apples and have a little bit of a say about the climate, climate change. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't explain why I've got one glove on. This is for the blackberry picking. You pull the branches to one side and then pick with this hand. I'll show you. Let me just explain something about the blackberry bush, which is very resilient, it seems. It's not suffered with the, uh, the heat so far, but I've, I've watered it to a certain extent because it, the roots just come from one place. So you, you know where to water rather than a bed of, you know, parsnip, for instance, which, which is there, you've got to water the whole lot. So it's done very well. But there are two sorts of branches that come off from the, bra the um, blackberry bush, sometimes called brambles, which grow profusely all over the countryside, wild in the hedges. But, um, yeah, somebody gave me advice once, pick a one that's produced some good blackberries and fix that one in your garden. So there are two branches. One is this one which is very long and it's good to have your secateurs knocking around so i don't read all of this so i'm just gonna snip it off there and this is searching <laughs> for the ground and it will root into the ground like it does in woodland and produce long looping sort of uh, branches which are a bit of a nuisance um so um, this is, has no fruit on it, but this will have fruit on next year. So this is next year's fruiting ones. So I want to keep that and make sure it doesn't get damaged. So I'm going to tie it up at the back against the fence. The reason blackberries are very good to, to grow is because you can just put them up against the fence. They don't take up, take up any space. So um, they're quite easy just to pin up against there. So that one will be, the leaves will turn around the right way eventually. Now this branch, which I did the same with last year, this is the one that's got the fruit on. And uh, I have to say, I've, I've taken quite a bit of fruit off already. And this is where the, <laughs> where the glove comes in, because uh, this is for picking the fruit, and this is for holding this, the prickly branches. The, the thorns are, are very sharp. You can get thornless blackberries. <clears throat> I did get one once. I wasn't over impressed. The flavour, um, they were big blackberries, but they didn't taste very good. So I've got a feeling these ones with the thorns on do better. <clears throat> now, if I know that this fruiting part is almost finished, and it hasn't, it's got some red ones on, so I'm going to leave this on. I could cut it off and take it from there, but these are the blackberries, and they just pop off really nicely. They don't seem to have suffered with any... Um, First, the birds haven't got them, and they don't seem to succumb to any sort of disease either. So they're just the sort of fruit I like. And then with one cut, one pick, get myself this, and uh, there's some blackberries just on that one branch. I have a number of those to go through, and um, so many that we have to freeze them. 
which is great. I've got some from last year. They freeze extremely well and they make very good jam, particularly when you go to the apple tree and make blackberry and apple jam, which my good lady wife, Margaret, is going to do. These are the blackberries I've picked just now. Uh, we've got a fair number, there's still some to come. The red ones here, would obviously, and the green ones are still to come. Uh, but I'm about halfway through, just over halfway through the crop that is here. And uh, yeah, very successful. Let's move on. Um, I've got some trees here. These are the apple trees from an old orchard that was planted maybe a hundred years ago in part of the, the grounds of the, the house that my house is built on about 60 years ago. So I've got two lovely trees here. This one is certainly, I'll just force one apple off, one of the apples that's gonna be on this tree. Seems to be doing fine, despite the very, very dry weather. Uh, the leaves don't seem to be curling yet. It's not showing many signs of the stress of the dry weather. So these look to be okay. But not this one, the one further down is, uh, sort of a, a cooking apple, eating apple, which is very, very good. A lot of these apples are quite high up, so only a couple of years ago I bought this apple picker, which I should have bought a long, long time ago, and it's very easy to use. Just send it up, pull on the apple, there you go. Actually, this one's hiding the fact that it's a bit rotten. <laughs> Look at this, a bit useless, but the others are great. While I'm down here, I may as well point out one or two other things we should do in OK. Uh, one, these are tomatoes here, and uh, they seem to be doing fine. There's no blight or fungus on them yet. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight plants. You have to keep them watered. And you'll notice I've got some uh, pipes leading into the ground. They're only about uh, seven, eight inches long, but they get the water right to the bottom of the roots, which is good. I've also got a, a rhubarb plant down here, which I bought and put in. Uh, champagne rhubarb put in last year, and uh, it seems to be surviving, but I've had to water it. Oddly enough, the last one I had got drowned in a flood over there. Well, this is my main vegetable plot. Um, these branches here are very kindly sprouted they're willow <laughs> and i know they do this you stick them in the ground just to support the tomatoes uh, which are doing quite well actually and uh, they've sprouted uh, this is asparagus and this is what happens to an asparagus if you leave the plant to go and uh, there's some beetroot here as well which has done reasonably well they didn't all germinate but i've got some very nice parsnip but i'm not sure how big they are yet i'm going to leave them for a while um but i'm high hopes for those at the back i've got a cherry tree which is rubbish it's uh, still alive but i rarely get any decent cherries on it oh and i mustn't forget to mention the stalwart strawberries which i've sort of left now they produce the fruit and good fruit it was too in uh, mid-june this year here's the parsnips
Yes, they're all poppies. I know they are. I just like the dried heads. And each head has <laughs> thousands of seeds in, but uh, they're harmless enough. Just look. That's just one head. I mean, there's got to be a thousand or so. And how miraculous that each of those tiny seeds produces the whole plant of a particular colour and shape. All that is embedded information in each of those seeds. It's a miracle, really. Uh, just flag up one or two of the bushes I've got here. There's a gooseberry bush and another one here. And they produce some quite nice fruit. And over the back here, it's not a blackberry, it's a loganberry, which is a sort of a, a match between a raspberry and some other fruit. But that's next year's growth. And I've replanted that from over the other side, over there. And... Uh, yeah, it should be okay. Oh, it's getting warm again. They threaten thunderstorms soon which would do the garden a lot of good well i think it might have been city foot in san diego who said in between times maybe i could do something about the garden always thought about it and we have special circumstances now because it is so so dry but something seems to have survived i tell you one thing we've um, uh, saved a lot of the water we don't have a, a dishwasher no we don't on, we can't really fit one anywhere. I'd like one, but we don't have one. So when we wash up, two things. You run the hot water, but then you don't get the hot water until all the colds come through the pipes. So we collect that. And then when we've washed up and we use an eco soap, um, we put that water as well into a bucket, bring it out and put it on the garden. And remarkable how much water would just go down the drain. And here's the thing, I don't think the water gets wasted as such it still exists it's just part of the system and the management of it so i hope the uh, water authority is saying where is john neil's waste water going we aren't, we're not getting it through because they want to recycle it well i'm putting it straight on the garden am i right am i wrong i don't know there's a thing about this um, i'm going to say this much now uh, about the climate change uh, quite simply it's only when things get really desperate and people die and houses are burnt down that eventually people listen to what was being said 20 years ago. I can only think of two people at the moment, Al Gore, the American, and uh, David Attenborough, warning us over and over again about the dangers of climate change. And it's only when things get desperate, people die and damage is done, that eventually the politicians, and it's not the politicians who decide, it's the people who vote for them who decide. That's what they want. They don't want to lose the votes by doing things unpopular. But now they've got to the point, as they've done in the past, to make a move. I say in the past, for instance, uh, in the 1950s, when I grew up in Coventry, air pollution was a big problem. And in 1952, I read this up, there was uh, a big smog in London, which killed 10,000 people. And Lots of people were, they had diseases because of it. It then took four years before the first uh, air, Clean Air Act came into operation. And another one was needed in 1960s. And at the time, I do remember it well, even in recent times, the chimneys from every house would be burning coal and smoke would be coming from those chimneys. The power stations burnt coal and produced coal smoke and it all went into the atmosphere so the air pollution alone was terrible all the buildings went black and uh, it took an air um, clean air act to sort it out in the end but it took a long time to get it done but it was only when people were being injured killed it you know diseases 
and people were dying of it that it, it, that it happened. And I think the same is happening now. It's only when the climate changes get so desperate as it is that people are going to take action. The way of the world, I'm afraid. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, thank you very much. And um, here's to next time. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.